very good morning to all of you. And uh, today is a very important day and event for us because we are conducting a webinar for a very important situation in the country as we are well aware. And as Sri Lanka Medical Association, we have been working on the capacity building and awareness related to the COVID-19 condition and situation from the very beginning. If you can remember, we had our first seminar on 30th January uh, 2020. And since then, we have been working with, with close collaboration with the Ministry of Health and the government and the UN agencies related to curtailing of this country. So today, the objective of our webinar is to clarify the doubts that you are having related to the COVID-19. Because at the moment, the situation has become a crisis and there are many doubts and clarifications that we need to be very clear about. So the idea of this webinar is to clarify those doubts. And we are having a very expert panel, uh, very eminent and expert panel here, uh, including uh, Dr. Deepa Kamati, who is a consultant epidemiologist, and uh, then Dr. Dr. Manoj Virasinghe, who is an expert in public health, and uh, Dr. Sapumal Tanapala, who is the president of the College of Community Physicians, and also on WHO, then Dr. Nidhi Kamalani, uh, who is the expert in immunology. So what we, how we are going to do is as a question and answer session, and this is conducted as a webinar because with the current situation. So we'll be directly straight away moving into the question and answers. The questions will be asked by either Dr. Smita Pisera, who is the secretary of the Medical Association, and uh, Dr. Sanders. So they will be conducting this session. What do you say? Thank you. The first few questions would be asked from Dr. Deepa. Uh, first question is, can you explain the, any specific symptoms that are associated with COVID-19 infection? viral infection. So uh, the, your question, the signs and symptoms are mainly the sore throat, fever, shortness of breath, uh, cough, and uh, most, uh, most of the symptoms are that. So majority presented so far in our country, uh, majority presented with sore throat, fever, and cough. Okay. The second question is, how does it get transmitted? or that it spread? Uh, it is transmitted from an infected person to uh, through droplet infection mainly to those who have contacted directly uh, from face to face or uh, through the droplets contaminated surfaces if another person uh, touches and the contaminated hands it can get infected to others. Uh, it cannot be contracted to airborne. Is there anything about that? Uh, the, this is a, actually this is a new viral infection. So uh, this is this is in a discussion and the scientific uh, uh, investigations are ongoing, suggesting that possible airborne, but still it has not been established. But it's established scientifically is a doctor infection. Thank you. Are some people more at risk of contracting the disease? And if so, yes, who are these groups? Yes, there are some people uh, have a high risk. We call them high risk, uh, considering the um, possible underlying diseases. So we call them comorbidity, comorbidity conditions like uh, diabetes, uh, heart diseases, respiratory infections, liver diseases, uh, kidney diseases. So. Uh, something like other con uh, considering the comorbid conditions, uh, we consider them as high risk conditions, and also pregnant women or uh, elderly people. So they are the people considering as high risk. Are children also at risk of contracting the infection and having severe disease? Uh, anybody who is having uh, direct contact with the Infected person is considered as a high risk uh, possibility of getting the infection. So, if children also get contracted directly, they also have the risk of getting the infection. But, getting the based on the existing evidence, the severity among children are very much less based on the global evidence so far we are having. 
Next question is, what about pregnant women? Pregnant women is usually considered as a high risk category. So mm, this is a because this is a viral infection and uh, considering the possibility of less immunity among pregnant women, it is considered as a high risk. So they have to be very careful in uh, facing an infected person and taking care. Yes, it is. A lot of people ask about I have a sore throat, I have cough, I have a fever, and they ask if actually when should I go and see a doctor? Now, uh, so I'm giving, telling this based on the uh, current situation in the country. So, we are at a very early stage of transmission. So, majority, if they have a history of uh, foreign contact or if they have uh, returned from a country with the high transmission of the disease, then and uh, within 14 days, if they get any signs and symptoms like we have already discussed of fever, sore throat, or shortness of breath, then they have to uh, see a doctor and attend to hospital uh, to get the investigate, investigated. So they consider as possibility of the infection. Uh, mm, I think that is the question. And uh, if I do have symptoms, and you said to go and see a doctor, who should I go and see? The GP, a consultant, and a private hospital, go to hospital, or where should I go to? The, those who have returned from foreign countries, as well as if they know that they have uh, closely contacted with the infected person or the confirmed case, they also have to see a doctor. See a doctor means uh, ideally they have to go to a government hospital, uh, ideally. So because uh, all the um, hospitals, there are some hospitals identified as designated hospitals for these coronavirus patients. So if they report to a nearest government hospital, they will be uh, transferred to designated hospital. But I would request if the patient is, patient is have a uh, uh, suspected coronavirus, like uh, direct contact or return from a uh, foreign country within the incubation period, then they have to wear a mask when they go because otherwise they will be spreading when they uh, go to the community. And I, if they uh, ideally they can get down the suicide ambulance because we have an um, agreement with them uh, for helping these people for their transformation. Because it's uh, highly contagious and all that, and you're not very sure if you're positive or not. So can we can they call somebody and ask before going about the symptoms? Yes, there are emergency contact numbers are uh, already circulated uh, uh, from media, as well as they at any time they can contact the medical unit also and get the advice. And uh, IDH hospital also ready to advise them. And Health Promotion Bureau is ready to advise them. And there are some emergency contact uh, numbers also circulated. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepa. Now I would like to ask a few questions from, from the MC. Uh, the thing is, uh, if a person has fever or cough, but uh, there is no contact history with the person, should that the person be bodied and go to see a doctor or get himself checked? Not really. The issue is, at the moment, as we are very clearly seeing, we are looking at contact histories because the epidemiological pattern of the disease at the moment in the country is clearly linked to a prior exposure to a case and a contact history. Therefore, a person uh, can get symptoms and signs, something like cough, cold and so on, which is a very common thing in the country, particularly at this moment. So, there is no, nothing to worry of a person who has not had any contact history as so he is known or any of his family members to worry about it. But the thing is that if he thinks that his symptoms are increasing or having a difficult uh, symptoms are coming and he cannot tolerate or he really thinks that he needs medical attention in the same way that they have to behave, go to a government hospital, get it checked, and they will be reassured if this is not coming within the case definition and the rest of the procedures that we have to take, 
but if not, they will be just given basic treatment and will set up. Uh, the other question is, there was a person who said that uh, their son came from a high-risk country and was met, uh, they met him at the airport, but the only thing is they only met him and then he was taken to a quarantine center. But they did meet him at the airport and then their body, did they get the infection, did they need to go test that or not? A good question, I think that is a question which many people ask, medical professionals and others. To answer that question, I think first we need to understand what quarantine and the process that has been adapted in this country for quarantine of the suspected exposures in this country. So let me first tell what is quarantine and how things happen here. Then the answer would come very no, clearly. Uh, MC, we don't, if quarantine would be asked after, it's just that these people want to know is would they get the, the infection? No, the issue is quarantine is to make sure that people who are supposed to be exposed should not be in contact with the community, so they put others in danger. So quarantine is to make sure to break any sort of transmission of an infection from suspected exposed to the rest of the country. That is why when we think that the, these people are exposed, that they are being restricted to a place and their restricted movement. And the second one is they are worried that if he will get the infection from others. The process is very clear, which is adapted. Those who have been quarantined will not be just brought and put into dormitories and sit. That is not the place. Thing is that they will be looked at from the, the exposure status, possible countries that they come, possible contacts they have, and so on then. Only those who are for a given country, given exposure status from the long histories that we are taken, that they are being placed in a given dormitory or so. There is very unlikely situation that they will get an infection from others who are with them in the quarantine because we do not know whether this person also has had that infection because they are already exposed. So I think we have to be very clear that is, we should not worry that this person will get from others in their quarantine facilities, which is a very rare occurrence. And up to now, from what I understand, just a few minutes back, I inquired about it. We have not got anything like that up to now. Thank you. The next question is, is it possible to test for COVID-19 to prevent quarantine? is a bit of a complex thing because if you prevent, I don't think that is the case. What we are looking at, there is a confirmatory test to COVID-19 for people who are suspected patients that who are being tested and to confirm whether they have their disease or not. The preventive actions are quarantine, self-quarantine and I Yes, uh, because uh, it depends on the sample. Uh, for instance, the nasopharyngeal uh, swab is less sensitive than a sputum sample. The sensitivity of a nasopharyngeal swab is uh, pub the published data puts it around 63%, which is uh, quite low, which means that people who do have the disease uh, can still be positive if a nasopharyngeal swab is used for testing. 
uh, a sputum sample is uh, more sensitive than an esophageal swab. And also the virus, uh, uh, virus excretion can be very variable. So sometimes a patient who is tested negative initially can be tested positive uh, based on uh, the, the type of sample and when the uh, testing was done. Uh, before moving on to the next uh, question, uh, we would like to ask you, I know we have a uh, lot of uh, people connected and you can always uh, post a question. Uh, just be ready with the questions and if your question is not answered, you can uh, put it on the uh, chat box of the Zoom platform. Doctor Rogi, Tatian, Babulo, the Kumura, the Valverine, 
प्रकाश प्रजावाद्य आडंबर मनोज के आशीर्वाद कर
could you uh, there's a message uh, if there are people who have cameras please uh, turn it off because there is an issue with bandwidth right uh, these questions are up to dr sapumar uh, uh, how far does the covid 19 droplets go <laughs> So just to answer the question, if you go to the CDC website and WHO website, it very clearly says there is a new disease, but going based on the SARS and MERS uh, patterns, it is one meter. Some of the uh, theories are being done by scientists who say that it can be more than this, but the current evidence is please don't go on social media or on uh, research articles done by individuals, go with the uh, science and see that SLMA, CDC, WHO gives you a global picture, not individual research findings. There are misconceptions being uh, thrown at the uh, public to create more phobia than required. That doesn't mean we need not, not be careful, but please go inside, so it's one meter. So keep them at the arm's distance length. That's what we have practiced all the at the How long does the COVID-19 droplet stay in air? Uh, so, say, once again, based on the WHO CDC guidelines, when you look at the website, it says uh, three hours, but it depends on the temperature, humidity, and other factors. So, like uh, 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 Dr. Deepa said, it is important that we stay away, and the etiquette of uh, clinical management or ARI, if you have a, a respiratory condition, please wear a surgical mask. That is the only condition that is given under WHO to wear a surgical mask. It is very unprofessional for non, uh, uh, don't adhere to the guidelines and you see people on the road, you can see people display masks for funeral houses, you can see masks given in weddings and you can see masks given. These surgical masks are given for health workers and if you misuse this mask, our health workers will be exposed to a greater risk within the next two weeks. And WHO has already given a clear guidance that there is a global shortage of surgical masks. And it's unfortunate that the health uh, sector is and the government uh, is not taking steps to control this as much as possible to save. Uh, what happens if a healthy person wearing a mask stay close to a COVID-19 patient in an air-conditioned environment for hours? So the question basically is that even if you wear a mask, if you're healthy, then that is something that we need to inquire because there's no reason for you to wear the mask and for the patient not to have the mask. Question is, as soon as you get the ARI, please wear a mask that can prevent you from spreading this disease or any other respiratory disease to the, the people around. So likewise, if you have a, a, a group of 100 in your audience, as public health experts, we know it is much safer to have a mask with the patient than all the rest of the 99 gram mask. Which would you offer? And that's what we are doing. We are now seeing 99% of the population trying to use masks where uh, the masks are being misused by. What happens if a COVID-19 droplet touches an eye of a healthy person? COVID-19 droplets cannot touch a healthy person if that COVID-19 person is detected and if he or she wears the personal protective items that is provided in the WHO guidelines, CDC guidelines and uh, the guidelines of the Ministry of Health which very clearly says that you need to protect yourself uh, and to protect others from getting this disease. So if there are procedures being performed, there is a PPE kit that you need to wear and that has to be enforced. It doesn't mean that you need to wear the PPE kit when you go and disinfect the house. And that's what we see in some of the situations now. Can the virus be spread by our pets or animals? Uh, once again, if you go on to the WHO website and CDC website and also the uh, epidemiology website, it very clearly says that there is no way that this can be spread from pets. And this evidence so far doesn't show any, uh, any, any such uh, connection. Thank you, sir. We have some questions to Dr. Deepa Gamage. Uh, this uh, scenario, say Dr. A was visited by a confirmed case of COVID-19. Dr. A met Dr. B briefly. briefly. Can Dr. B, who never met the patient, be effective? First time, that question. Now, to make it a bit clear, that Dr. A is the uh,
treated for a patient uh, confirmed case. But uh, Dr. A is not infected now, just met another Dr. B. So, uh, what is your main question now? Uh, can Dr. B, who never met the patient, be there is no risk for Dr. B now because Dr. A has got exposed but still not symptomatic. This is also still we have to uh, uh, do the assessment based on the time of the exposure and the time of the uh, Dr. A meet with Dr. B. So if Dr. A treated the confirmed case and just came out and just met Dr. B on the same day, there is a very much less risk because Dr. A is not spreading the, uh, shedding the virus or then it's not infected. But suppose now Dr. A has got the infection from patient and after some time he is now, uh, he has got the infection and now spreading, uh, shedding the virus. Then there is a chance if Dr. B is closely associated and uh, with Dr. A. So, I think this is, uh, you cannot give a definite answer, but uh, case by case you have to assess based on the time of the exposure and the uh, time, uh, the duration of the time of the incubation period, Dr. A meet with Dr. B. And the um, possibility of the infection, uh, Dr. A is getting the infection. So, so the question once again is, when, the, when Dr. A treated patient who was diagnosed COVID, was the doctor wearing PPE? The other question is, was the patient wearing a mask? So the chance of Dr. A getting the virus is much or no chance of getting, getting infected. So the important thing here is, if any COVID suspect patient with ARS symptoms, please wear a mask so that you will not expose Dr. A or Dr. B or Dr. C or even ask to any exposure of this virus. Even if Dr. A gets infected, like we have seen in our know, a colleague getting exposed, that uh, colleague, as soon as he or she gets, uh, has to wear a, a, a mask or, or a, uh, so that we can prevent the spread to Dr. B, C, D, and E, and F. Now, uh, this uh, patient is come from case. So now, what should Dr. A do? Now, Dr. A is confirmed. Yes. Not, not. Doctor, the patient is confirmed. Uh -huh. Dr. A treated the patient. Now, what should now Dr. A do? Yeah, right now, uh, without knowing that this is a confirmed case, now Dr. A treated the patient. Now, later on, uh, the doctor got to know that Dr. A got to know that this is a confirmed case. Now, uh, that is also based on the uh, type of uh, uh, exposure. That also matters. Uh, then we have to do a little risk assessment also. And Dr. A will be uh, self quarantined idea. Uh, based on if he was not on uh, full kit of PP, if the uh, doctor was on full kit of PP, there is no risk for him. But if he is not on full kit, then uh, we, based on the uh, risk assessment, we can advise for self-quarantine for 14 days. What should Fourteen, days, yeah. okay. 14 what? days is the maximum possible incubation period based on the uh, existing evidence, global and the local existing evidence. Now, uh, what should the Dr. B do? Now, Dr. A is a confirmed case. Now, Dr. B, Dr. B, that also depends on the at what time Dr. A met with Dr. B. If he has met at the very beginning, there is no risk of the second contact. But if Dr. B met with Dr. A, uh, very closer to the date of onset of symptoms of Dr. A. That is maybe two days before. Usually at the moment we are considering two days before. So then Dr. B also has to be self-confirmed. Dr. A is confirmed. If Dr. A is not confirmed yet, Dr. B should be vigilant but no need to. No need. No need for the Dr. B. If Dr. A is just made, uh, treated and case is confirmed, Dr. A is not having any of the signs and symptoms, then Dr. B just have to watch. Uh, the next one is a bit a technical question. What is the difference between infectivity, infection, and disease? So I think infectivity, you are asking about the infectiousness. So uh, now uh, infection is when the 
virus enter into the body and person is suffering from the disease that is from the uh, that is the infection has already got into the body that is the infection infectiousness is the time period where that person can transmit the disease to others that 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 varies from disease to disease but for this disease it is considered that latter part of the incubation period just before occurrence of the signs and symptoms maybe one or two days before this viral shedding can happen so infectiousness starts little early one or two days before onset of the signs and symptoms and it can transmit during the throughout the disease when the uh, virus is detected for this particular disease i think dr nirika and uh, both of you can answer to that so viral shedding has been identified even little longer so even after based on the global evidence it has been identified after recovery also recovery from signs and symptoms still patients have been shedding the virus so this has been identified globally so uh, the discussion there is uh, whether this uh, viral shedding can infect the others or not is not very clear but because of this identification of the shedding of the virus identification of the virus and viral antigen uh, people think that the possibility of uh, transmission is will be there even after so that is also some discussion sound point but not clearly established scientifically established next question if one has come in contact with a suspected or confirmed case of covid 19 is it necessary to quarantine is it necessary to quarantine suspected immediately suspected case suspected means not confirmed not confirmed case suspected case suspected case then we don't have confirmed case confirmed case then the post contacts will be confirmed right? and special conditions over quarantine is contact tracing done only on confirmed cases or is it done on suspected and probable cases as well? In our country, our now, uh, strategy we are practicing is uh, all the confirmed cases, those contacts will be identified and contacted for COVID cases. Not for suspected cases, only for confirmed cases. Uh, the next question would be uh, a few questions from Dr. Prasanelika Malaviti. Uh, first one, uh, what are the samples that are taken to test COVID-19? Tell, tell us about the test as well. Samples, regular samples, this is a data coming to or a student sample. If it's a data coming to your it should be sent in viral transport union. A student can be sent in a white uh, uh, school headquarters. Uh, some people also take oropharyngeal swabs. They, they are not as sensitive as nasopharyngeal swabs. If you can, it's best to then combine the oropharyngeal swab and the nasopharyngeal swab in the same uh, viral transport media uh, container. And they should be sent to the lab as soon as possible uh, at 4 degrees in ice. Uh, uh, so that, that is very important. And then collecting the sample, uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, the, the healthcare person is exposed to the patient. So it's very important to gather personal protective equipment. Uh, and the recommended test currently is a real-time PCR. Uh, there are several types of WHO and CDC recommended tests. So the labs basically use one of those WHO or CDC recommended tests uh, to confirm the infection. Thank you. And the next one, in connection to that, how do you transport the sample? And also, if I can't send it soon, what should I do? So the sample should be sent in four degrees, that is in ice. And uh, now it is, uh, if you can't send the sample, you can store it uh, at four degrees, but uh, I just caution that because I don't think in our country, it is good to actually put the sample in a, uh, in a fridge, contaminating everything else in the fridge. So it is far better to actually collect a fresh sample and, and send. Only if you can't, then uh, with the greatest measures, store it at four degrees and send to the lab as soon as possible. But a fresh sample is always preferable. And how long does it take to get the results? Okay, so the real-time PCR test is actually uh, a little bit long. So from the time of obtaining the sample in the lab to uh, for the results, it can vary 
from four to five hours, especially when you're processing a large number of uh, batch of sample, uh, as most labs are doing uh, these days. The next question, uh, question come uh, from a lot of people. If it is possible to test, what is the earliest possible time after contact with the suspect confirmed case? I think everybody discussed that right now. Uh, so there is no such test to uh, find out if somebody is infected and, uh, and do daily testing. So, uh, but if somebody is showing symptoms after contact with the positive patient, uh, as soon as the person is showing symptoms, then the person can be tested uh, for, for possible uh, presence of uh, coronavirus. So, uh, yes. symptoms and the contact history is very important. Yes, both. Right. The next one. Uh, COVID-19 IgM, IgG antibody rapid kit uh, is in the market. It takes only 15 minutes, if I'm correct, uh, to give the results. What is what is the place of that? Yes, so this uh, kit was developed by China. Uh, there's another kit developed by South Korea and another one developed by uh, uh, USA. So the Chinese uh, study has been published saying the sensitivity of 88.6% uh, and the specificity of 91 something. Uh, that is in China, but at the same time, I think it's important to evaluate these kids in uh, each and every country because of the background of infections present. So, for instance, uh, there have been reports that patients with COVID-19 giving false positive results sometimes in dengue, and they are a dengue endemic country. So, we have to keep both in mind that just because it's uh, uh, even particular results in a in one country, you sort of need to uh, evaluate it in, in every country uh, because of the differences in, in, in the, uh, all these infections. So currently we have got some samples, uh, free samples uh, from uh, several companies and we are trying, we are undergoing evaluation in COVID-19 positive patients uh, who we have identified uh, with National Infectious Diseases Hospital. So once again, if you look at the WHO CDC guidelines, uh, currently they are uh, like uh, like uh, Dr. Malini said, they are they are reports from countries that this is working, but we need to uh, check it at each country level. So currently WHO does not recommend uh, it as as the test for uh, uh, for decisions on COVID nineteen. Next question after Dr. Rohini Madanambi, she is also a microbiologist working at Lanka Hospital. Uh, the questions people have is uh, when they go into the community, that is, they are going on the roads and all those things, how can they protect themselves from getting an infection? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, it, it is really important these days because uh, uh, now we have this care of uh, community spread. So uh, there may be people who are exposed to positive cases or um, uh, I mean, the, in crowds where they are not aware whether they are exposed or not. So then uh, we have to practice uh, social distancing. There are some words now these days we are talking about. Social distancing is one. The other thing is cough etiquette and hand washing, hand sanitization. Uh, hand sanitization. So these three things, if we practice mindfully and knowing what we are doing is very important. The thing is now you have to identify, um, we all have now talked about the, the type of the virus that we are dealing with. So it's like when you are fighting with an enemy, you need to know, identify the nature, the behavior, and the survival and abilities of the enemy. So this is a kind of enemy that we are trying to fight and we know. So um, specifically, you need to know your uh, enemy where that enemy comes from. It is coming from an infected person, that infected person just before showing the symptoms as well as for a long time that shedding can happen. The, the, the most um, trivial phase is the catarrhal phase where uh, sneezing, coughing and the secretions coming out during talking, coughing and sneezing. So these secretions are the kind of enemies that you are going to deal with. So you have to be uh, at least three feet away from the symptomatic person. And uh, if, if maybe during this time we have, as everyone talks now, common cold and flu as well, which are very similar symptoms. 
But if we drastically differentiate these three with crude method, this is a, a, a condition where cataral phase, that means the nasal discharge and sneezing is less here, but um, the sore throat and the cough and SOB are the, with fever are the main features. So, so make sure that the people with those features if they are around, in and around in your social um, uh, backgrounds or societies, make sure that uh, they are well isolated according, I mean, they, they should be notified to the big unit and the health ministry and where there are um, the notification systems are going on. And then the social distancing with them. So uh, the house quarantine has to be practiced very well. Uh, that means if somebody is affected and known or suspected, that person should be given a separate room in the house. And also um, others should, and that person should have a separate bathroom also. That is the best if, we, if you, all of our society people can have that. If not, uh, there should be a, a quality practices uh, regarding uh, what we are doing, knowing what we are doing. So in, in buses, and trains and that is called uh, social segregating points and supermarkets, uh, movie places and uh, the, the, where there are matches and all, those are the social places we have to avoid 100%. And the, the, then what, uh, the, there, there comes the, the reason that you need to go to a market, supermarket to get your stuff and you may have to go to a bank um, for uh, uh, things that you are dealing with because you can't get isolated from the day-to-day -day world completely. So make sure when you are going there, if you have to be in a queue, uh, have a queue which is distant from the each other, at least hands length. Right? And in, in that particular moment also, if somebody is coughing and um, sneezing, uh, better to uh, inform them to have a tissue and, and at least you have with you some tissues if you don't have any mask and make sure that you catch the cough or the sneeze into that tissue and put it into a covered bin. That's very important. And also, um, uh, when you deal with money and um, uh, cash, always try to use your card and that, it, that should be able to disinfect. And uh, uh, better not to use uh, the, the paper money and the coins during this time because those are also uh, going from hand to hand which can get infected so precautionary uh, measures in the society are such that and, and your phone is another thing make sure that phone is uh, not touched all the time try to use uh, um, the, the ear, ear uh, I mean the, the earphones rather than using your phone you can keep the phone in your pocket and um, earplugs can be used and things like that uh, knowing the the, the way that the droplet can come to your nose and mouth and eyes, make sure those things are protected. Uh, and if you touch your common places during social events, make sure that you wash your hands with soap and water. And also there are other measures that you can use like uh, alcohol-based hand rub or um, uh, soap and water. And uh, other uh, because this virus is covered with a fat layer, the, the, the fat layer dissolving things are effective. So uh, your house and, and, and people uh, in, in uh, uh, places where the, the buses and trains, I saw that they are using 1% uh, hypochlorite gases to clean the surfaces. So that is a very, uh, very much needed requirement. Now, uh, a lot of places are clean like that and surface cleanliness cleaning three times a day in social places are very good. And the, the places where you are going, if they are not clean, they better not to touch. How can I protect myself from getting infected within the hospital setting? That's in the public sector, it is in the hospital. Yes. In the hospital also, the, you need to identify what kind of hospital you are working. There are sentinel hospitals, there are uh, IDH-like hospitals which are uh, dedicated to positive cases right now. Sentinel hospitals where there are all the suspected cases getting admitted for triaging and, and all the other purposes. So those places, the people who are working are fully trained and given all the required necessary things and looked after it. So abide by those training and go under those trainings and all the practices, again the same practices uh, uh, excessively taking to prevent uh, aerosol uh, 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 
I mean, aerosol precautions, you call it airborne precautions and droplet precautions. So, contact precautions also involved when you touch surfaces of the droplet inhabited places, that is called contact precautions. So, that includes all the PPE, including visors, uh, masks, and uh, the full kit with the long sleeve and blouses. So, um, so, very positive cases where there are IDH, they have a very uh, specifically uh, driven uh, gears for those activities and other places also those who are taking samples has to be taken fully precautions and others can be prevented. It says that the reception point, they can use hand gloves and the gloves when they have patients, uh, uh, cards and the, the things that the, the normal hospitals where there are people not identified as sentinel hospitals or um, uh, the, the positive case uh, for hospitals, those places, all the doctors and the uh, healthcare workers can act as uh, primary precautions, uh, can use primary precautions. I mean, main droplet precautions can be taken with the mask, just a surgical mask. So they need that. And uh, frequent hand washing stations as well as frequent hand rubbing uh, places should be there. And again, the laboratory people, they, there are other etiquette that you need to practice. They are also trained and given those in instructions. So uh, please uh, abide by those instructions and guidelines given by your, your heads and the microbiologists where they are working in most of the hospitals have given instructions and they are there for you to get their advice. And because we can't talk every detail in this forum, but uh, with the, the set of questions laid down, we are uh, talking in brief. So uh, whatever other questions are coming up, we are ready to answer. So I think there are infection prevention guidelines and infection prevention committees in all these hospitals. So as, as long as you activate them and check whether these are being implemented, then I'm sure all the health workers, like Madam said, uh, will be uh, safe from any infection uh, or spread of the disease. So it's important that we reinforce some infection prevention in all our institutions, not only the hospitals uh, where they are isolated patients, but generally in all hospitals across the country. Okay, just to tell you, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikram is online. If somebody wants to ask a question, can ask also. Madam, last question is, how are public places, that's our homes and all of that, uh, what are the chemicals that we should use at home and uh, yes, strength yes. of it and all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of people are um, not aware what will kill this, uh, what uh, substances can kill this virus. As I said before, this virus is consisting of a fat layer around where when this fat layer is dissolved, it is unable to infect us. So therefore, um, soap and water can kill uh, that fat layer. And uh, the, the bleach, uh, if you want to uh, clean your floor, you can use 1% bleach. And uh, if you want to uh, clean your clothes, 0.1% uh, bleach, uh, because the healthcare workers, when they go home with their uh, attires, if they are entering the home, it's good for them to uh, shove it inside the 0.1% uh, bleach, that is uh, chlor chloride, chlorine uh, hypochlorite solution, and uh, uh, the use a gloves when you are washing in it. And surfaces, uh, there are alcohol wipes uh, available. If not, again, you can use deep oil like uh, soapy uh, substance to clean your surfaces because bleach is corrosive to certain surfaces. Um, if you can afford 70% alcohol, and alcohol wipes are very good too. Uh, why, uh, if you suspect cough and cold in, in household people, which we don't know whether it is COVID or something else. Uh, the next question would be for the Professor Sivira Singhan. First one, case scenario, my son who came from UK is now in a quarantine facility with 10 more students who have come from different countries in, in a dormitory. As they are kept together, my son who may not be infected also can get infected. Therefore, can't he be brought home and self quarantined? I think part of this I have already answered the issue of self quarantine. Quarantine is basically restricting movement 
of an apparently healthy person who is suspected to be exposed to a communicable disease. So the first thing that I want to tell is the effectivity of institutionalized quarantine and self-quarantine, there is a huge gap. If there is an institutionalized quarantine process going on, they will be kept away from the society for a very specific period, which will be monitored a couple of hours a day, providing they are the basic facilities that they need, and they will not be allowed to move out. On the other hand, self-quarantine depends on the discipline that you have as a person to be quarantined on your unit. So I first will tell about self-quarantine at home and then I will tackle the actual question that you have raised. If you are at home, and you are getting self-quarantine. Looking at the Sri Lankan situation, looking at the Sri Lankan households, looking at the Sri Lankan culture, how effective and what and how possible for a person who comes from outside the country, maybe several years after, coming to your home and can you lock them inside your house and make sure that he has very little contact of or no contact with others, at least within the house. He is an apparently healthy person, but he has been exposed and we do not know whether he will develop or not develop the disease. In our culture, it's very unlikely you can have a strict restriction of that particular person within even within your house, preventing contact with others. Which makes that others are also getting vulnerable and exposed to a possible communicable disease. So think about seriously, practically, how it is possible. That is the case. So secondly, if you are in an institution, you are kept in a place because the whole purpose is to make sure you are not exposed to society and you are not putting others in the society in the danger while you are being very closely monitored to see whether you will be getting the disease. Therefore, what I'm going to tell is if there are 10 law students or whoever in the dormitory, how this placement is done? This placement within a room, within a dormitory, is not an ad hoc process. This has been very clearly thought about previously, and as far as possible, I'm very clear as far as possible, people with same exposure in this situation, those who came from the same countries, possibly from the same flights. Those who came on the same day are put into this enclosure, which means they have very likely to have the same level of exposure and it's unlikely that they are spreading the disease among themselves, but they are being prevented from giving this communicable disease virus or agent to the outside. So it's very unlikely, I don't think anyone could uh, be uh, afraid like to that extent that my son will get from others. Because your son is, this thing is already exposed, exposed in a country where we have designated there is high risk of getting the disease. Therefore, to the greater good of the society, on one hand, on the other hand, for your own safety at those in the house, you parents who may be possibly elder, your grandparents and others who are the most susceptible in any case if you get the disease. So the best method is to have an institutional type of quarantine to those 
and we will prevent you, you household people from getting the disease from one hand. On the second hand, we will prevent the society and you being a threat to the society. And third, your son will be very closely monitored in that place. And if any sign symptoms come out of this, he will have very prompt treatment and excellent medical care to the extent that we can provide. I think the answer is clear. The next two, two questions, sir. I need short answer. Yes. First one. Uh, what is the difference between isolation and quarantine? Very clear. Isolation is for those who have already infected, and we are risking their movement to make sure these infected persons are not coming to contact with the society. Quarantine is those who are suspected to be exposed to a given agent. And they are also we are restricting movement. So one is a case, one is a suspected exposure person. Next one, what is the difference between lockdown and curfew? It's a hot topic. What is lockdown? There are different definitions if you go to even to a dictionary. I went through so many things today. To verify because I have a separate actual opinion on that. Lockdown is preventing exit or entry of people from a given geographical location, basically in this case. So lockdown is that you do not allow anyone to enter or exit. So it's a place like you are being strictly prohibited of your movement from a ge given geographical area but that does not mean that does not mean you will not move within that geographical area you have to be very clear about it you can lock down a district but it does not mean that you can uh, move across you can't go to the next house or so on curfew is just a tool that can be used for lockdown, where the police will enforce law to make sure you will not come to public places, you will not travel on the roads, you will not be seen in public places. So it's just a tool. Lockdown is a strategy, curfew is a tool that can be used to achieve the objective of lockdown. Question to Dr. Ananda as he's online uh, because the infection uh, is evolving. The COVID 19 is uh, we had a case definition, and should the case, this case, case definition change uh, over time when the infection evolves and when the cases increase? And what is the new case definition today? At present, uh, actually, we decided to change the case definition yesterday. Uh, until yesterday, the case definition was. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, until yesterday, we used the case definition of uh, uh, suspected case. Uh, there were three categories. The first one was uh, if somebody has come from abroad. We don't use it for the purpose of the easiness. If somebody has come from abroad developing respiratory symptoms with fever, uh, so that was the that was one category in the suspected case. And the second category was if there's a contact, close contact uh, with the positive patient or a suspected patient, uh, then that also taken as the uh, as a possible uh, suspected case. And the third one was uh, until yesterday we were. Uh, considering severe pneumonia uh, without explainable etiology. But today, uh, sorry, yesterday we decided to change it to uh, any, any pneumonia. Uh, so there are two purposes of this. One is when we suspect, we need to isolate and test and confirm or exclude. Uh, and uh, so that is the main purpose. And if the caseload increases, we might uh, change the definition. 
but at present this is the definition uh, we are planning to uh, uh, we, have, we have decided to use Uh, next question is healthcare staff with minimal symptoms where contact history cannot be traced. Do you recommend any prophylactic treatment or early treatment with uh, HCQs or chloroquine? Uh, this is a question from the audience from Dr. Anjala Balasurya. At the moment, uh, there are no recommendations on the prophylactic treatment. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, the healthcare workers with minimal symptoms are anyway not considered as a suspected case. Uh, for that matter, not, uh, not only healthcare workers, so anybody with minimal symptoms without who does not fall into that category, I, explained, I mentioned before, is not uh, considered as a suspected case. Uh, so we don't, uh, there's no recommendation for prophylactic treatment at present. Uh, is to Dr. Sampoman. At the moment, there are no other questions uh, that we can speak to Dr. Uh, Sumitra. But if Dr. Ananda wants to give any more comments, he's welcome. He'll be asked the other question. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sumitra. Somebody has uh, somebody wants to repeat the case definition. Uh, so I'll repeat it. So if somebody comes from abroad with symptoms of uh, respiratory tract infection and fever then that is considered as a suspected case. If somebody has close contact with the suspected case or a, a confirmed case, that is again taken as a suspected case. Uh, the third category is if somebody is having pneumonia. Uh, the close contact means if somebody is having or somebody, if somebody is living in-house or if somebody is working in, the, in a close environment, uh, especially in an air-conditioned environment, for say, if somebody is traveling uh, in a car, air-conditioned car, uh, that is, if it is more than 15 minutes. So, uh, just a just a chat on the way, uh, or just meeting somebody, or with smiling with somebody is not not taken as a close contact. So those patients need not be self-quarantined. The self-quarantine has to be done if there's a suspicion of close contact without symptoms with the person who is suspected or uh, sorry, with, who is confirmed as having a uh, having COVID-19. There's another question from Dr. Second definition of clinically suspected case is acute respiratory illness plus contact with a confirmed or suspected case. Does the guideline recommend referral to treatment center and PCR for patients with COVID contact with foreigners? Not a suspected case. The foreigner is not a suspected case. Uh, contact with the foreigner. If the symptoms are suggestive, yes. Yeah, if the symptoms are suggestive, then at present, because uh, even though we, even though the foreigner does not have symptoms, if the contact had been close, uh, we would, we should uh, test that person. That's why some of the tour guides were tested, uh, even though the the tourists did not have symptoms. There's another question. In subclinical infections, there is a risk of infecting others, although you are not symptomatic. Therefore, isn't it safer for all to wear masks to stop the spread? Uh, the chances of spreading in a subclinical from a person who does not have symptoms is minimal. 
there had been uh, some reported cases but uh, uh, the chances would be minimal that's the first thing the second thing is wearing a mask has to be done carefully if you don't wear the mask properly then the chances of getting infection would be higher than not wearing a mask a lot of people you can see wear the mask push it down uh, often it is in on the neck and you touch the mask uh, and then you touch the face uh, these these are natural thing naturally happening thing uh, not conscious thing so therefore wearing a mask has to be done very carefully uh, and properly otherwise the risk of wearing it will can be higher than not wearing the mask this is different if you are seeing patients if you are seeing patients then it is different uh, then uh, for that occasion you wear a mask if it is a confirmed case then you we are full uh, protective personal protective equipment uh, on the other hand if you are see, seeing any other patient no if you are attending to a patient yes then you should wear a mask during that period then you can remove the mask and throw it away properly thank you dr ananda at the moment those are the questions on uh, uh, to be asked from you okay this question is for dr sapumar is there any evidence of community circulation of the virus at the moment i think it's a very good question and uh, uh, people also could have answered this this question first is also uh, in that area so if you look at the who there are four scenarios that you have identified and each scenario you need to act differently and it's given in very clear guidelines to what to do each scenario the first the scenario is the first case some countries or small number of countries are yet to experience the first case uh, then the second scenario is you have sporadic cases and the third area is a cluster of cases and the last uh, stage would be community transmission so if you look at our global pattern you will see certain certain countries in 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 these four stages sri lanka actually is between the second and third stage because there is a, a, a clustering in certain pockets especially within households and close neighbors families so uh, if you look at the guidelines on on, on spread and prevention based on the eight area which is on the wto website you will see that for this situation the recommendation is by general public should not wear masks unless you have a respiratory symptom and it's important that we practice this as i mentioned earlier the reason is because n95 masks and surgical masks are short supply globally and the raw materials are from china in wuhan so which means that we cannot use general uh, uh, measures uh, like we would use for the last scenario so i think who is coming out with a very strong statement to governments to Uh, because there is a global shortage, please ensure that these uh, messages are clearly followed by the public. Because if not, our own colleagues, clinicians, and health staff will not have PPE items, especially N95 surgical masks, for use if this level goes to a uh, community transmission. And that's why Deepa said we are trying to uh, restrict movement to make sure that only essential staff come to work, and and these health services are supported and strengthened. to meet and uh, in the unlikely event that we go from a clustering to a community transmission and that's why the government uh, the thanks to the uh, the technical expertise of our public health colleagues and the team of administrators and the clinicians microbiologists and virologists and everybody that the task force are taking very bold decision on how not to uh, allow it to spread even uh, within the family so uh, Uh, WHO is extremely pleased with the way that the country is going forward to curtail this as much as possible with all the stringent measures, despite knowing that it's going to affect our economy uh, extremely bad uh, uh, to a very high level. And not only that, even the income of the general population also is going to affect, especially because majority of our people are daily wage earners. So it's important that we do the right thing to protect the fam families and individuals as much as we can. please as i appeal to you please leave the personal protective equipment for the health workers and the teams who will be dealing with patients if you uh, require a mask please uh, wear a cloth mask or any other mask and leave the surgical masks for the health workers that's the appeal that is coming from who headquarters 
WHO regional office, CDC, and 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 to all the countries. Just I think one I think to, just to clarify when uh, the Sapma said. At the moment, Sri Lanka, we are seeing between scenario two and three, what we are telling is, we are seeing cases in very specific groups at the moment. So not in the public community acquired cases. Therefore, it's very specific groups. So be vigilant on those and please try and help to prevent it spread to the community. Single first having kiya na kila kiu ni sa ni sa kiba yutte itam pahedi liba dhanata dhanata tiya na apni jangi yu na parna samya phagan di pa isielu maaya itam suvisheshi khanda ya thulai ema rogi hamila tiya itam suvisheshi khanda ya mam ita rakin aapu ay ya samag ita kitu inge suru kar ko ay sa ha एक सम आये तो इतना किट्टू इन बड़े कर गया है इतनी पीटे सामान्य प्रजावें लविच्चे और दैनिच्चे रोगीन में बने तुरुत देखलने हैं एनी साथ हमारे यहाँ पे शेष एम डॉक्टर सापुमाल पहले जो कि हुए एनी साथ दैनिक तो प्रजाव तुला बाय में मतलब हो कालबल भी बड़े कार ना अपने कोमरत कालबला में विशेषण लग गए एनी सा� ऐनी सा करुणा करला अभी पाविच्छिक करना मुखावर ना सर्जिकल मास सा ए 95 मास की है ना कारण है दी एक करुणा करला साउथ के कार्य मंडल वलट इतुर करना मुकदमे देने टा अपने ए संबंधें लेबेन थोगे वाले गेटल वक्ती बने वाम मुकदमे ए गेटल वो इन्ने ए वा इन्ने पिटरली निसा ऐनी सा करुणा करला ये वा साउंड के मार कांडा है मेटर साउंड के बलदा रिंटर साउंड के सेव के नित्रु करण ने किया ना पानी भी दे देने के लिए कई किया ना थी द मेंटल डिस्कशन फॉर दीपा इधर आस बाय डॉक्टर हाथी निभा रहा है कर साउथ कोरिया हैं सक्सेसफुल इन दे फर्स्ट इन कटेली कोविड नाइनटीन the strategy has been contract, contract tracing and testing them all. What are the barriers we have to do that? Is that lack of financial uh, resources or income resources? Uh, I think we have to understand what they have done, not only South Korea, but even the China, they have done this, this strategy. What they have done is, uh, they have, ident when they identified a patient, they have traced the household symptomatic patients and got them down to hospitals and tested them. It is not, uh, our strategy here is uh, uh, somewhat similar because those countries, there is an issue of not coming patients to hospitals because of some uh, other issues also, like they have to pay for the hospital and some, uh, they have to look for some insurance facilities, so that kind of uh, issues that they are for people not seeking health care and they tend to stay at home. Because of that, they sometimes forcefully got them down to hospitals. So our strategy here is the same and little uh, more extended than that also. What we are doing here, when we identify one confirmed case, we trace back all the contacts and even uh, um, these uh, travel guides, they, trace all the places where they have traveled and identify all close contacts and uh, look for uh, their um, situation, like whether they are having any signs or symptoms. In that case, we prefer them to for hospital admission and testing. That is how some of these cases, even though you see one of the patients is next day say confirmed, one is related to the initial case. But even though you do not know, uh, that those patients have actually we, we requested them to go and admit to hospitals and sometimes we send the suicide ambulance to get them down to hospitals so like that is how we identify this clustering of households or their travel um, contacts or some those uh, link, linked patients we have identified in that way 
even though you just see one positive patient during the next day. But all the contacts we get down the uh, local the public health uh, officers, that means the medical officers of health and public health inspectors, and uh, even directly from the epidemiology unit, we instruct them for all other asymptomatic patients for 14 days uh, home quarantine. So then uh, the police officers are also helping for that uh, to help care staff at the regional level. So I think at the moment, uh, this, is, this is a very big activity. Uh, as soon as we get from laboratories, the positive cases uh, during the, by the evening, so all the healthcare staff, even at the field level, working till 10, 30, 11 at night, identifying close contacts and start working on that the next day, uh, throughout uh, during the next day, and as early as possible, making them uh, quarantine and identify symptomatic patients for testing. So we also practicing this extended uh, activities. I think uh, most of the time our own colleagues don't appreciate themselves. So it's, it's, it's up to us uh, to actually do. If you just go to the epidemiology unit, you will see the, the operations that they do in contact tracing and discussing with the regional uh, epidemiologist, the medical officer of health, the PHIs in tracking all these contacts. They have one by one a tracking system. And it is not easy. If you look at the first case, the Chinese uh, lady uh, the first came, there were 64 contacts. And I'm sure the, that captain who went to the Royal Thomian game also must be having quite a large number of immediate contacts. So this operation, like Professor Manoj said, when you ask them to isolate at home or, or, or quarantine at home, most of the people actually do not abide. They start going to the neighbor's house or to a shop, etc. And that is why the health team with Dr. Deepa and the team requested the police and the forces to assist them to make sure that they remain home for 14 days. And our appeal is, please, if you have been contacted by the FH unit or your local area and merge, remain home for 14 days because that is a public requirement currently uh, uh, done by the Ministry of Health to curb this disease from spreading from those uh, disease, uh, the cases we have identified to the rest of the community. And, and uh, once again, epidemiology unit is doing a great job, marvelous job, and uh, in these systems, uh, uh, under very difficult uh, situations and circumstances. That's good. That's one, because in the morning before I came here, there is a MOH area designated under me. I went and met the PHIs, I went and met all the staff there. They are doing an incredible service at ground level with very little actually facilities available in our setup. They don't ask for more facilities, they do their job. When a PHI goes, when the MOH goes, please respect them. And from our medical uh, officers and our colleagues here who are listening to this, I'm very politely asking, please contact them whenever you suspect the case and get their help. They have been very clearly instructed to do it. Those people who have been surveyed and under surveillance are your patients. If you are private practice doing patients, GPs and others. Please cooperate with all these ground staff. They are doing an impossible task, but they are doing it. So please help them. Please respect them. Please give the fullest support to them. In the morning, I came from a place where we are tracking 51 people in houses. It's a very different game. It's a very effort, full effort game. So please support. Question from Dr. Ananda. Also, can we have false negative patients and what can we do? What can we do in those situations if there is a high clinical suspicion? Well, the chances, uh, the chances of being uh, a negative results in a patient with uh, obvious clinical symptoms is very unlikely. 
The second uh, thing is if, if that's a, if you have a negative report and if you still suspect it, uh, then repeat the test next day. After after 24 hours, repeat the test. One question to Dr. Deepa. I think it's a question that we also all are thinking about. Is this the first week or seventh week of Corona spread in Sri Lanka? Because first patient Chinese lady was found about six weeks back. <laughs> I'm looking at the epidemiological point of view. So first case is an important case. So we have a lot of other important cases. We cannot discard all the. We cannot discard all the important cases. So we have to consider from the first case throughout. But if somebody thinks that that is a little away, and we should consider only our country cases, I would say that there are some other foreign nationals we have identified even after we have detected the Sri Lankan cases. So because of that, and still. If we consider the, if we discard the first case as a not a case from our country, it's important. So there are some other important cases in this Italian returnees and some other uh, poor quarantine uh, groups. If we when we identify cases within the uh, 14 days of the during the this period, they are also important cases. So because of that, we cannot discard the first case. Looking at the epidemiological point of view, we, we have to consider all the cases as we can categorize in a different way. We have a uh, consultant communication. Thank you for coming today. Uh, we have a question for you. Can you explain the roles and responsibilities of doctors and media? I'm representing Health Promotion Bureau as well as Communication Focal Point. Before going to your question, I will explain what is our role and responsibility as focal point, which would be much easier to, easier for the other doctors and the journalists and the media to understand their responsibility. So risk communication is uh, has a crucial ro role in this sort of a epidemic situation. So though we are the focal point, we just do not communicate anything directly to any party. So we have a very good liaison with again, all the stakeholders and whatever we communicate, we have a ver verification system because in this sort of epidemic, it's, it is very important to have a one voice and the trustworthiness and the credible information that go to public. So in risk communication, we uh, like as media and also as uh, all the doctors, we have to think of five main areas. First one is the risk communication system. I think in this epidemic, the system is very well set, which is initiated by epidemiology unit that we were also able to uh, like get into this because initially I think they started epidemiology start, unit started this mission with all the other uh, stakeholders not now in January even before the first patient was reported that was the preparedness and first guideline was made even before the first Chinese uh, patient reported so within that guideline they have included the liaison with us how the risk communication should happen. The system is there is a spokesperson for this endeavor. The spokesperson to uh, divulge all news related things is the Director General of Health Services. So we have a daily, like initially we had regular press conferences. Now, as, as the spread is increasing, we have 
only press conferences with all the other main stakeholders and director general of health services represented there. So all the numbers and the details that the journalist and the public should know should know is set by the spokesperson. So this is nothing new. This is in uh, uh, what we call is e code. This is set. Yes, we all are bound to the e code as uh, government service that none of us can just tell our opinions to public for most important news items. But we all can tell everything technical, that is quite okay. But the something related to the patients and the numbers is changing very frequently. So it is set at a particular time by Director General of Health Services. So all the chapters, and I kindly request all the journalists to listen to this and the press, which is on live by the Department of Government Information and adhere to that. Rather than just like as, as all the doctors, we know the hospital doctors, the people who test, we all are knowing, it, like you know, we all are interested as Sri Lankans, you know, to see how it is increased to inform, but be responsible to send, to have the correct mechanism of sending the information then and there. There's a mechanism, there's an epidemiological focal point and direct general of health services. This is very important. Because uh, the virus is spread, yes, but the misinformation is spread even exponentially than the virus. So th this is very important. So please listen to the spokesperson. And as journalists, please do not uh, try to, you know, I know the news is really important. News value is really important. But let's get together in this endeavor and get the numbers and the details at the press conference. And dear doctors, uh, you all do a great service, but you know, get the proper channel to divert the information about the patients. And the second thing is the internal and partner communication, which I will tell what is having it at the national level, then you can set it at each hospital, which is very important. National level, we like, you know, for all the messages that we send to public, we get it clarified from the epidemiologic unit because they are the technical expertise. So we are the communication expertise uh, at HPB. We, 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 just, we doesn't just make messages and send. Everything is clarified from the relevant agency and, and send. So, and we do it then and there. It's very important. So at the hospital level, like our request, what you should think is the internal and partner communication at hospital level. If you should, like, you know, if you should have a plan at each hospital, the, at the OPD is the first encountered place. So once you encounter the first, the, these patients, which word to send, which place, like, you know, who's going to be informed, that even the laborer should know. If from the gate, you know, from the uh, OPD entrance, they should be directed. To prevent this communication is really needed to prevent every parent is being contaminated. But we should not stigmatize them. So we have a big role as doctors and also as journalists to get rid of this stigma. All these patients, like, you know, like this is spread all over the world, not only in Sri Lanka. So if we stigmatize them, they will not divulge the real fact. So we should go into their shoes and look at this, uh, this problem, especially the first encountering doctors are crucial. So we should empathize at this moment, but it is, uh, but it, it's quite normal for us to be if we are like we, all of us to be stressed, but it's quite normal. It, like it, all over the world, it's like that. But as health professionals and as journalists, here we, we should empathize with all the patients suspected or con confirmed and 
the communication is the key crucial point to prevent the spread and prevent you know and make their family member to be quarantined at like to, to adhere to the home quarantine measures everything can be done if the first contact doctor and the hospital staff they do a marvelous job like we are like greatly thankful for all health staff uh, and uh, yeah they do a marvelous job and and uh, i will just to, to conclude i will think i will say the public communication should be done with sensibly giving correct information what to tell and what to inform and what are the places to get the correct information so as uh, dr sapna said the epidemiology website or scientific details and health promotion bureau they have a hotline 1999 which is 24/7 open in all three languages if anybody who need more information and to be have a different service and to listen and to get clarified call us at the same time many things go in social media almost the misinformation is going in social media so to have a uh, if you are a social media lover so we have health promotion bureau sri lanka facebook page which is quite uh, frequently updated in your style to get the information so stay with us we responsibly i think together we can com combat the problem thank you thank you dr priyanka we have a question uh, what is the test available uh, in the private sector the government sector is it pcr or serology so is it available pcr is the only recommended test uh, which is recommended by the who and cdc there is no other recommended test you have to do real time pcr to confirm it there is currently no place for serology Uh, to do uh, confirm uh, uh, COVID nineteen. Just to add, uh, we have to be very mindful. There are these uh, companies who come with these kits and and uh, try to lobby use of them. Please be uh, vague. Uh, WHO has seen certain kits where they have come. Without the company name, anything, and they try to lobby. So we should be very mindful that the only approved kit is the test that we approve globally is the PCR, real time. Uh, one other question: Somebody has asked, is it okay to use these cloth masks, Doctor Sapu? Uh, if you remember when we were in in uh, doing our internship for general procedures, I think a, a normal mask is good enough, but. When it comes to management of COVID patients and those procedures, uh, if not, there are clear guidelines give which type of personal protective items that they need to use. So please go on to the website and use the appropriate uh, personal protective items for your procedures when they use it. So I think India has started this uh, movement where they are uh, uh, the Christmas are being used to uh, sew uh, normal cloth masks because that will be the only one available if we. Don't use our surgical mask rationally, we, but that will not protect you uh, and the, the health workers from COVID-19. So that's why there's an appeal from uh, from the WHO and from the Minister of Health. Please keep the surgical mask for the health staff. How about the from the available? Yeah. Right. That's a question. Uh, this is actually. Uh, Uh, this is about uh, the case definition. Uh, Dr. Samar Sir has asked. Uh, according to the newest definition, should all patients with pneumonia be screened for COVID-19? Uh, if there is no other explainable etiology, yes. If it is, if it is an obvious bacterial pneumonia, there is then there is no point of uh, testing for COVID. Uh, but if it is uh, not, then yes, yeah, please do test. Uh, and if I may add uh, to what uh, Sapu said about. Uh, Using the surgical mask, uh, it, it is not not to leave that for the the hospital staff. The hospital staff who is who are attending these patients, positive or suspected patients, use N95 mask. 
when there's no suspicion, if you're handling another patient, then of course you can use a surgical mask. The, simply because the, it is not effective of using surgical mask, don't use surgical mask in the community. When you're going around in the bus or going to a shop, there's no point of using surgical mask because it's not effective. On the other hand, it, it, it can make things worse. And uh, if I may add a little to media, uh, the one of the main things the media should tell public is the, the danger of having gatherings. Uh, I, I think if the media explain this to the public repeatedly, uh, then that will reduce the gathering. Of course, uh, from this evening we have a curfew, but until that uh, there can be uh, the gatherings. Now still people are shopping. Uh, now, just to quote an example, one patient got it because the patient's uh, son came from the UK and just visited his father just for a day. So that contact made the gave, gave the, the uh, made the difference. Uh, so therefore, it is very important to uh, prevent these people from gathering. And on the other hand, we have seen sometimes the media tend to encourage these gatherings. Now, last uh, Sunday, one paper's headline was uh, in the sports page, the Royal Tomian brave COVID-19. <laughs> that was, uh, I mean, a very ridiculous uh, headline. One should have uh, so, uh, shown, actually said that it, it should not have been done. So that sort of gathering should be avoided. Can you say it in signal to the media, please? उदाहरणी निर्भया एक हम मोड़ हेडलाइन निकाल तो वो एक अपन तो देख के जितने हेडलाइन निकाल ने एक अरुपु देख मोड़ एक हेडलाइन निकाल बोल दिया इतनी ये वाकी देवल में नोकिया है जनता वाट किया ना मेकिंग में ना प्रश्न है मिनिस्टर एकतुवी में तमाई में क्या देने विनर आटा वाला में क्या पैतीरु ने मिनिस्टर एकतुवी न ऐसा मैं वाके तंग मरते जनता व्यक्ति भी मवारक पला मैं बिनों द गमन्याम मंदना गमन्याम मैं वा संपूर्ण नवत पला इलागे टे मैं शॉपिंग या मैं वा नवत पला पुलवान तरंग हमांगे अत्यावश्य देवाल लोट वितर गमन गमन सीमा करने की अनेक जनता वट पहली कला देने की अनेक तमाई माध्यवली मिशेशिंग मिल जाती अति आकर्षणीय है दिन का अति रोना शीर्ष पार्ट है अब तो शीर्ष पार्ट है अति रोना कारण आकर ला हाथ पारा के गनी तन में मुगल बोहो बिटर ये गनी शीर्ष पार्ट है अति इन्हें एक दफ्ते आ तोड़ दूर आप बता देंगे इफ इट्स अ सेंसेशनल और वेरी अनयूजुअल हेडिंग ऑफ एनी न्यूज़ साइटम इट वेरी लाइकली � and that is not responsible reporting. So I would really, really ask our media colleagues and others to make sure that if they get something like that from somewhere, first thing you have to do is to verify with authorities before sharing. And the other thing is there are so, so much of uh, social media groups, even within the medical profession, and unfortunately that we see totally unverified false news has been shared without at least thinking twice. 
So please do not post or share any of those unless you have verified. So if you will share the, that is as a, uh, was told earlier, it's viral than COVID-19. Dr. Anand, one question, is there any vaccine or treatment for COVID-19? Uh, I think uh, they have started a trial on a vaccine. At the moment, no, no approved vaccine, but uh, it, it is said that it will take at least uh, uh, at least a year, minimum of a year, uh, for the vaccine to come out. Uh, on the other hand, there have been many uh, drugs which have been tried, but there are still there is no conclusive evidence of, uh, of the efficacy of those drugs. Uh, so basically, there is no 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 definite drugs. There is another question. Uh, Dr. Most of them, I uh, from if you take figures from China, more, about 80% were uh, having a mild illness. Uh, only 20% had significant illness, but probably uh, that is without admitting very mild cases. At the moment, we admit all the patients. That is to prevent the spread of the infection. Uh, so few can get some complications. It is a if they get complications, then depending on the complication, then we have to treat. Uh, it's a viral pneumonia. Later, it seems to be getting uh, secondary bacterial infection or fungal infection. So it's a matter of supporting the lung until the, the body gets rid of the virus. Uh, so if they become severe, then of course we'll have to support them with oxygen, sometimes with positive pressure ventilation, uh, and so on uh, with looking after other uh, organs. Sir, uh, several people have asked about uh, antiviral drugs, probably Avigan and chloroquine uh, and immunoglobulins. What do you think about them? Uh, there had been uh, some use and trials uh, on uh, chloroquine and also uh, another new antiviral and also some antiretroviral drugs. Uh, but again, uh, no conclusive evidence from these. There's a question, uh, last question, last question, as there are a lot of people who are asymptomatic, should we wear the mask? Sorry, I, I didn't get the question. I think now uh, it is very clear. We have talked about this uh, the requirement of wearing the masks. Who are the people to be there? So uh, the healthcare workers, those who are uh, 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 the, 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 the treating uh, symptomatic cases, they have to wear to protect themselves and all the suspected cases. And those who are having signs and symptoms, if they expose to some others, then those people have to wear to prevent the transmission from them to others. Those who are working with foreign people uh, uh, frequently uh, and they are with a very uh, short distance, less than one meter, with the contact, continuous contact with the foreigners, then they can wear to protect themselves. For others, at the moment, based on the uh, situation, the Ministry of Health is not recommending to wear uh, face masks to general population. If this strategy is changing, we will, the Health Ministry of Health will inform at what condition and what kind of categories to wear this face mask. Until then, for the moment, it is not recommended. Once again, I think on, uh, uh, as a colleague, I appeal to all the doctors, please read WHO CDC and epidemiology website which gives you very clear guidance in how to relay a message on what is done to uh, prevent this COVID spread in our country. Please adhere. Don't go with the individual ideas and thinking in trying to say that there are uh, sporadic cases etc. And, and try to deviate from the, uh, the norms of the science in this world. There are individuals, as I mentioned earlier, who are doing sporadic research with two or three patients or 20 patients trying to create a false sense uh, of uh, 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 management systems within the country for their personal vested interest. Please go through the science. 
read the uh, guidelines from CDC, WHO, or and the Ministry of Health. They are evidence based, done by the best of the clinician and the public expert globally. This is a global issue and not a Sri Lankan issue. But we need to act Sri Lankan because our resources are, are, are limited. As I mentioned earlier, I don't mind if any of you all wear uh, uh, cloth masks because that is not an area, and as Dr. Anand said, it will create more infection. My humble appeal is keep the surgical mask and the N95 mask for rational use. And WHO is coming out with a series of papers and, uh, and educative material on this in the next two, three days. Please read the website daily, and I'm sure you will be updated on the, the science of it. Thank you. Siluma Madre, Binsa Madia, I can never let us. Aha, Raja Prouti Department was a Margis Pradan in the Sandis of this, a Margis answer this. Sauka Matia, she is out to work in a car and she will win a year's salary. She says she's put the Aka to Karnava, open visit Labadi, and a million of Karana for Tripatina, one car, Nomila, Sauka, Vinkara, Saha, open with a Kalkarapu, Vagaki men. Madia, Parita, Karad, in Stuti, Idriata, Tapite, Kekatu, and Kela, Ila, Sitina, Mema, Tapte, Samaneva, and Stuti, Saukia Matanshi. With that, uh, we come to the end of this very important webinar. I think we had a very fruitful discussion, and a lot of doubts were clarified, and the importance of contact tracing isolation and the return to the basics of public health like the hygiene and the proper sanitation we are going to do all these for highlighted so i think our health system we have a strength actually and our strength is the public health system which is very strong so i think with that strength we can curtail this issue because our strength is in the public health and if we can make some that i think we we can come out with this issue as a country and probably we can set an example for other countries as well I would like to thank all the resource persons who have joined with us and they have shared very valuable resources and also the SLMA, the, especially the technical group, Dr. Pamod, and we have all helping at, at this very difficult time period. And all of you, all the media who came and the SLMA media committee as well as the community disease committee uh, and the, the two resource, the resource persons and the two moderators, all of them and of Kalyan Gudi. I thank all of you for this very successful media webinar conference and all the participants and also Dr. Hasini who has coordinated this event. So thank you and we will be moving forward from this webinar. We will be circulating the messages, the very important messages of this webinar using our social media and the web based platforms and further we will be using these discussions and the conclusion came to lobby with the decision makers to move towards a correct pathway in curtailing this issue. So thank you, and together, I think we can come out with this issue and the crisis. Thank you.